Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning. Welcome to today's edition of an ICAT play date. My name is Phyllis Newbill. I am the uh, Associate Director of Educational Networks here at ICAT and the Center for Educational Networks and Impacts. A couple of housekeeping things before we get started this morning. First, you're all on camera. We have a 360 camera right here that's uh, you can so wave to the world out there. Uh, and we are live streaming right now, and this, uh, this will be documented and, and saved for online later. Um, there is a sign-in sheet. Make sure that you sign in. This is how we justify donuts, so it is extremely important. Uh, new this week, you can get PDN credit. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about a thing. You don't need it. If you would like to get PDN credit for attending today, Talk to me afterwards and we'll make sure that you get that. If you're online and you would like to get PD and credit for attending today, please put a note in the um, questions link to let me know that, to let me know that you're here as well. The questions link is online for those of you who are watching out in the world. We'd love to have your questions. Send them on in. I'll get them here and share them with our presenters. And with that, Oh, please turn off your mobile phones also. So if you've got a, a phone that's going to ring in the middle, today, now's a great time to turn that off. Today, we have a team, obviously, a team with us from Posture Portraits, which is a fascinating um, ICAT-funded project, and we're so glad to hear what they've got today. Um, Dr. Andrea Baldwin is part of Virginia Tech, um, a Women's and Gender Studies, Africana Studies in Sociology. And the remainder of the team is also is at Connecticut College. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce them. Ms. Heidi Henderson, Dr. James Sangyun Lee, Tyler Silby, and Bazid Shazad. I'm so glad you all are here this morning. I think we're going to start with a video, and then we'll, um, we'll go with your presentation and more things and questions. Hello, and welcome to the Posture Portraits Project installation at the Moss Art Center. Posture portraits were nude or partially nude photos taken of freshmen or transfer students as a mandatory part of the university's enrollment system. The requirement was in place from the 1900s to 1960s and was reported to have taken place at colleges and universities, including at women's colleges such as several of the Seven Sisters, Bryn Mawr, Barnard, Radcliffe, Smith, Wesley, and Vassar, and was also taking place at Connecticut College. The students were told the portraits were part of regular physical education practices and were designed to promote better health. Students who did not meet the requirements for good posture were forced to enroll in health classes that were intended to correct the physical failures of said student. The posture portraits were a violation of privacy and stripped students of their autonomy. The eugenics movement was also sweeping the U.S. during this time, attempting to create a link between posture and body composition with intelligence. Dr. William Sheldon was a psychologist who requested the photos from the schools around the 40s and 50s. He believed that physical traits were indicators of certain personality traits and hoped his research would perpetuate the practice of eugenics. The posture portraits were a direct reflection of a Nordic idealization of beauty that excluded people of color the working class, and those with physical disabilities under the theory of eugenics. Today, we aim to take back our bodies and truly reflect on not only our perceptions of us, but the social perceptions we face as well. Again, welcome to the Posture Portraits Project. Hello, uh, this is uh, a few years ago at the Connecticut College, 
uh, when we started the pro uh, this project, uh, we set it up the uh, photo shoot uh, booth in the basement of the library. And then uh, what we are seeing is that the uh, time lapse of that uh, event. So we gathered uh, people around the, from the classes and then go through some uh, procedure to take a pictures. As you can see here, uh, one student, I believe, then pause, and then we take a picture, as well as we also collected the uh, three-dimensional data with the uh, depth uh, sensors. So this uh, video shows that the uh, kind of a full process of the data acquisition uh, steps uh, for the first project. But the, uh, right now, our work is like the second generation of the, uh, the project, and then we had a, a similar setup outside, just outside the cube. And then we've been through uh, several shows already with the many uh, students and uh, faculties and friends. The idea was that the students would have autonomy um, in choosing whether or not to take a photo. They were obviously clothed, <laughs> and um, we felt that this could be more empowering than the initial uh, having to take posture portraits without giving consent. Um, what we see is that also coming from the first generation of our installation that uh, sort of the prototype simulation, how we visualize the, uh, these photo taking uh, practice uh, we just did with the current students in the population. So the interesting idea I had in mind at the time was like not just uh, taking a, a momentary pictures at the moment and but also how they approach to this uh, practice, you know, taking photo, how they come into the scene and how they live. So that was a part of the uh, visualization at the time. And this part uh, is like a particle simulation that uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, realizing the idea of uh, destruction of the evidence. So many of the institution we studied, uh, they sort of uh, destroyed all these uh, photo taking practice and the photos and the, all the records. So that is one of the most striking fact uh, I learned at the time. So that particular visualization was like a, my way of uh, kind of realizing that the uh, destruction of the uh, images. So I am kind of the archivist on the project. Um, and so just to give you some background on the posture portraits itself, we, um, Heidi actually was my, I used to work at Connecticut College before I came to Virginia Tech, that's the connection. And so Heidi was my faculty mentor while I was at Connecticut College. And um, when she shared that she had just learned about the posture portraits, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into what was this about, because I'd never heard about it. She'd never heard about it. James had never heard about it. Many people I know have never heard about it. Um, and so we got this grant from the Ammerman Center for Arts and Technology at Connecticut College, and I took a group of students to the archives all around the Northeast, including the Smithsonian Archives, the archives at Smith College, Wesley, Barnard, um, Smith, uh, Radcliffe, a lot. We went to a lot of archives. And what we found is that the practice was, as you heard uh, our narrator say in the first clip, that there was this taking of posture portraits, but it also included measurements of the students' bodies. The thing about the posture portraits that were very striking was that you, when first year students came in, it was part of orientation. It was a required part of orientation. So think about our Hokies coming into orientation and saying, hey, what are your pronouns? <laughs> and then after that, having to either strip nude or semi-nude and go into a booth where the person who is taking the photo is also a male um, and taking these photos and having someone scrutinize your body. And um, once that happened, if you fail because you could fail, 
you had to enroll in posture classes. And so for instance, at many of these schools, there was a class called Rhythmic Fundamentals. And if you, if you didn't pass that class, it jeopardized your graduation. <laughs> and so this is kind of just as some, some background on, on the practice itself. We learned that the practice started in the 1920s and it was required from our research, it was required all the way up until the last time we saw it required was it at Barnard, where it was required, the last year was 1967. After that though, it was still highly recommended. So I want you to think about those of you with power in this room, as a student comes into uh, the university or to the college, if you tell a student, oh, this is not required, but it is highly recommended, um, how you think a student would feel, do you feel like it would be, like they're like, no, I'm not gonna do this, or would they feel compelled to take these photos? Um, and so I'll pass it back over to James to talk about what's happening, happening on the screen right now. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. The, right now, what we are seeing is the second uh, generation of our installation or the performance or the show. We just call it all different kind of name for that, but that's happening right now, right here. I mean, you should come. Yes, definitely come to see us. It's so exciting. But uh, the video is showing uh, the first part again, but uh, audio is needed. Okay, good. Um, this uh, cube, uh, this facility is uh, so unique in a way that uh, uh, very different from the, our first generation of installation. The first generation was mostly very traditional interactive media installation. You just go in small space and then do something and then it, some interesting thing happens. But right here is that the fully immersive environment with a very nice uh, screen and then you know, everybody can have a decent amount of stage space. So we redesigned the whole idea in a very different way. Although, you know, the central scheme or the core concept stays same, but we need to come up with a different way of uh, presenting a uh, similar concept. So we had the same practice taking uh, photos and the photo acquisition. But this time what we tried is uh, most distinct from the first generation in the real time uh, data acquisition and then fit it into the real show. So this is happening, well, this is a little secret by the way, <laughs> right? I shouldn't tell. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I probably need Spoiler to start alert. Right here, yeah. So come to the show and then see it. But there is a, a participatory experience we can uh, present and the audience will see and the live performance of course in the stage of the cube and then all the immersive, very massive, uh, the visualization of the particles and all the good, interesting stuff. And then maybe we can talk about a little bit of performance. Yeah, we're gonna do an exercise. So if everyone could stand, you guys too. All right. You guys can stand too. <laughs> okay, and I'd like you to close your eyes and release your hands. little bit of a length up the back of the neck, but you're trying to stand without a great deal of effort. And what you'll notice if you tune into your physical being is that there are tiny little shifts of movement that happen. The weight might spill in one direction or another a tiny bit. And the more you pay attention to it, the more you feel it happening, even though you don't have to make it happen. So this is called the small dance by Steve Paxton, who was the inventor of contact improvisation. In the small dance, you realize that you are dancing all the time, even when you are thinking that you're just standing there. Anatomically, your muscle fibers cannot hold the weight of your body against gravity for a very long time. And so they pass the load onto their neighboring muscle fibers 
And those muscle fibers, tiny as they are, have a different relationship to gravity. So the tiny little shifting of weight that you feel is the muscle fibers passing their job onto their neighbors. So inside the body, the cells are collaborating on keeping you standing. You can open your eyes and sit down again. So it's a meditative practice, but it's also a practice that allows you to realize that you are engaged in a dance against gravity 24 seven, right? Maybe not when you're sleeping and completely released, but whenever you are working in a relationship to gravity, which is not completely prone, you are actually engaging in a dance. Um, so again, credit to Steve Paxton, inventor of contact improvisation. So my part in the initial iteration of the project was a performance of posture in crowded situations. So the first time I did it was in um, the reception for the Ammerman Center for Arts and Technology Symposium. And I have a white jumpsuit that I embroidered my posture. So anytime a bone would comes to the surface of my body, I embroidered the location of those bones on the white jumpsuit, and I stood in the middle barefoot of this reception and practiced finding empathy with other people's postures. Um, and it was very interesting, because when you do something like that in a, in a situation where it's unexpected, half of the people ignore you, <laughs> like that can't possibly be going on over there, that weirdo in the white jumpsuit. And then other people get very curious and, and come up and talk to you while you're trying to do your thing that you're, um, is, you don't want to talk during. So that was my initial, initial event associated with the first iteration of this. Now I'm basically the sort of stager of it. So I'm <clears throat> helping with the narratives and helping with moving people around the space, this amazing space. Very, very pedestrian, very minimalist. Say goodbye. Do you guys want to say something about your part in the process? Yeah, so Bazid and I um, worked with Professor Lee over the summer, and just in the last couple of months, um, we did research with him at Connecticut College about the Posture Portrait Project and helped him out um, making these visuals, some of which he saw on screen. Um, we're very involved right now in trying to collect data in terms of pictures and the uh, 3D scans, which we talked about. Um, and yeah, just making the performance flow smoothly and get the uh, interactive elements. So I, I won't spoil it either, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, we we hope to see you there. Uh, yeah, Busy, do you have anything? Yeah, uh, so we worked with Professor Lee to come up with the vi visualization of the project. So we spent most of the summer like experimenting with different parts in, like, in Unity, like the VFX graph, and like uh, a lot of it, uh, even in Blender, like we modeled a lot of stuff. Uh, like there are parts here that are modeled, but like they're presented in a very abstract way. Uh, but yeah, it's a lot of exp experimentation with the the artistic side of this project. Just as a <laughs> conclusion with the, after my two of my great students, I find myself as a researcher and educator, it is so fascinating more, not the result part of it, but the more of the process part of it. So working with the students over the summer, yes, we learned a lot. Many of them not used at the end, but it is the whole process we develop and then find the inspiration and then get to the uh, very final moment. But, but we just started, we have uh, lots of more things to go, right? <laughs> <laughs> question? Thank you so much. <laughs> this is what I, this is a, uh, and I say it every week. 
my mind is blown at least twice a week at ICAT. Here we go again. Um, I, I love this, and I love the way we've brought together the technology and the sociological history and ask these, and the dance, and, and just ask these hard questions. Um, and I'm fascinated to see the show as well. Um, can you talk about when the show is? How can people come see it? So we had our first show open to the public last night, and we had some very, very great feedback. Our second show, second and third show, will be at 5 and 6 this evening. We have a class coming. Uh, we are doing class shows. So we have a class coming at 125 today. And then there are also shows at 12 and 1 on Saturday, which we know we are in the heart of football nation. <laughs> and there's a, low, uh, there's a home game happening. But we will go ahead and risk it. Uh, <laughs> um, but if you want to get tickets, you can get tickets on the ICAT events website and on the Moss Art Center website as well. And it's free. And it is free. <laughs> $3.99. And it is here in the cube. And here in the cube. Yes. Excellent. Are there questions from folks in the room? I've got a couple online, but I'll, I'll get to those as we get there. But I want to give an opportunity to folks in the room. I'll come to you. Please introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, I'm Margaret Lawrence. I work here at the Moss, and I'm really fascinated about this project too. And I wonder um, if any of you would like to answer this. Um, what, in this context, what does the word performance mean to you? I have a very open definition of the word performance. For me, performance means that somebody is watching somebody do something. In a very, I mean, in here, we have this incredible opportunity to engage with technology. I, I shouldn't get near a computer because <laughs> I will break it, but um, to work with human beings in relationship with the technology has made this really interesting environment for performance. Um, it's hard to separate what is part of the performance and what is not. You will enter, you'll enter the lobby and be immediately part of in the performance. I just want to add to to Heidi what Heidi said to say that in for me in this space the performance is not only done by the people who are actually part of and have their narratives and are the people who we've been rehearsing with, but the audience are also performers in this space because it's interactive. And sometimes we, I, I won't give away much, but sometimes it is really awesome to see how the, how the audience interacts with us differently from, from show to show. And so they are a part <clears throat> of the performance and although they're not the performers who we rehearse with, they are in fact performers as well. Wonderful, thank you. I'll come over to Christina. Uh, so as a aunt of, uh, my niece went to one of those sister schools and now I'm uh, like my mind is wondering, when was the last year that it was highly encouraged or strongly encouraged for the posture pictures? Well, we aren't sure when was the last year it was highly encouraged. Um, we had, so once we did the summer research, we have been kind of doing this. <laughs> and so the research has, in terms of going back to the archives have been kind of stalled. Um, but we have also, what, the one thing that we didn't say about our research is that we actually interviewed women who had posture portraits done. We interviewed seven women some from Connecticut, the majority from Connecticut College, one from Wellesley and one from Vassar College. And um, there's also, Heidi knows of one person who was a person who taught the posture class. And so we have um, the, the felt experience as they have related to us. Um, and so we are able to use some of that, although we are not using their narratives in the actual performance, we are actually using some of the the what how they said they felt mm -hmm. and and so one of the prompts can i say this 
the first prompt that we, for our performers, the prompt we asked them f to, to respond to for their narratives was, when was the first time you felt seen? Because for us, the, the people who we interviewed, they, th they t all talked about how um, they felt about having the posture portraits taken then in terms of their memory, but also in terms of how they felt talking about it at that point. And the majority of them felt that it was wrong. That, uh, and then also as researchers, we were, we were in a conundrum because we felt as though there was some trauma that this research was bringing up for people who had the posture portraits done. Um, but to go back to your original question, um, we just know that, and we just know that for Barnard. So that we, we also can't say that this is the time that it ended at other colleges and universities. We just know that for Barnard, that 1967 was the time when the requirement had ended. We couldn't find, because as James had alluded to, um, a lot of the records have been destroyed. Schools, before we got to some schools, they denied that the posture portraits had even ever even happened. We just found out, a colleague of mine just emailed me two days ago to say that when George Bush was being, um, when he had been elected for, to, president, to the presidency, that Yale accidentally burnt all their records of the posture portraits when there was an inquiry as to whether he had had one done. <laughs> you know some very famous people who've had posture portraits taken. Hillary Clinton had a posture portrait taken. Meryl Streep had a posture portrait taken. Naomi Wolf wrote about the posture portraits in her book, um, The Body Myth. Um, and so we do, and we're sure that there are a lot of other people who've had them taken that are in the public eye that just we just don't know. So we've got a question online. Um, is there any documentation or do we know if there was any objection to this practice of the posture portraits oh, yes. while, it was in, while it was happening? Oh, yes. Um, using Barnard as, another, uh, as an example again, uh, when we were going through the archives of, and I'm, I just want to say that when we went to, I'll get to that question, when we went to the archives, especially the archives in the Smithsonian, we were told that we were not going to see any nude and semi-nude photos. When the boxes came, <laughs> they were lots and lots and lots of nude and semi-nude photos. And it was almost like we were given permission from the powers that be, but not from the people who had their pictures taken. And it felt really, really awful to be looking at people's bodies and not have their consent. And so for us, this is why consent is very important for this project um, and in general. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, at Barnard, there is a yearbook where black women and Latinx women were complaining about the part about having to take posture portraits. Um, at Connecticut College, there were students who, I think were taken in the post office, the old post office? There's an article about that. Yeah, there's an article in the student newspaper. So all of the, the protests or all of the speaking back to not um, outrage of, about the posture portraits were in student-led uh, um, magazines or yearbooks or newspapers, and so the College Voice, there were students who were talking about having to go take these posture portraits and how they were wrong. So we have students, yes, definitely speaking back. I'm, we haven't really come across where faculty spoke back, and so for faculty who are listening or in the room, um, I think that we need to think about how we are going to be seen by history uh, in terms of how we stand up for, for students and for what we believe in. Um, so we have, actually evidence of faculty, including university presidents, <laughs> saying that these students were going to take these pictures. We don't really, you know, it doesn't matter how they feel, but they're gonna take these pictures. And so I think that says, you know, should be a warning to all of us. We wanna go down in history <laughs> as yeah. people who are nice. We have Time for maybe one quick question in the room. There's one over here. Let me get there. Oh, yeah. 
I, I'm Michael Borowski. I teach in the School of Visual Arts. And I, my question is related to that issue of consent. I was curious if you all talked to any students from the, the restaging who declined to be photographed or scanned. Yeah, we had, um, we had actually, I wasn't here at the performance last night, but when we had the class come in uh, yesterday, we had two students who did not consent to have their photos taken. Um, they came in late, so we didn't have a chance to talk to them unless you had a chance to talk to them. I didn't get a chance to talk to them. But off of that question, what was, what was related to, relayed to me about the performance last night where faculty came, we had more faculty refuse to take photos than students. And so there's a lot that we're processing as this is happening. And so for me, that becomes a question about what is consent, really, when you are being told by people with power, you can consent or you can't consent, um, versus faculty who came in and decided that they didn't want to, but there was no power dynamic in terms of who was asking you to consent. Um, I'll pass the hike. Here I can. Did that see what? So there were more students who did not consent last night than I know Leslie said the other, but there were only three adults last night. I don't know whether they were faculty or not who did not consent, but there were eight students last night who did not consent. Um, yeah, so, but those, it was very, a very interesting difference in that the other two classes all knew each other. So I think it's more about what James brought up that the first, Andrea's class was our first, our dress rehearsal, so to speak. They all know each other. They all already feel very comfortable with each other and with discussion of the topic. They were all very willing to engage in the participatory part of the event. And then the media-based class was the next group we had. And they also all know each other. And they're very interested in the technology that they knew they were going to see. So there was sort of buy-in already. And then last night was the first performance in which people chose to come on their own, maybe assigned by a teacher. We don't know. We do have a post-performance survey that we take. So all of the people who come in sign a consent form whether or not they have a photo taken so that we can do a post-performance survey. And then we also have a short Q&A that we record. So we may get some of that information. Great. We are at time, and I just want to thank you all so much for sharing your project and your process with us. This has just been enlightening and fascinating to me to understand that this process even happened, um, <laughs> that the, the first part even happened, but your process to explore it, I think, is, is really uh, wonderful. Um, a couple of quick notes to close with. Next week, our play date will not be here. There will not be donuts here. If you want donuts next week, you should come to the Creativity and Innovation District's Living Learning Community. Uh, we can give you more information about that. They'll be online as well. But we will not be here. The donuts and the play date will happen in the community assembly area in that new Living Learning Community, that brand new building. We're so excited about it. Um, so be there for next week. Come to the shows tonight. Get your tickets online. And... Finally, happy birthday, Dr. Baldwin. Yeah.